my name is Aidan Perks, I'm from Star Refrigeration. Today I'm going to be talking to you about low charge ammonia systems and CO2 refrigeration solutions. We've been using ammonia and CO2 in the refrigeration industry for quite some time. Um, over 160 years have we been using CO2, uh, ammonia for over 140 years. So it's, it's old but it's going strong and it's going to be around for a while too. Why are we moving away from HFCs? Well, at the moment, with regards to F-gas legislation, there's a large reduction in the amount of HFCs that are going to be produced over the next few years. We're looking at a total reduction of 80% of the equivalent CO2 kilograms um, by 2030. So, with the re reduced availability of HFCs, we've noticed a massive price increase across all the range of the HFCs over the last few years as well. Uh, when you have a look at refrigerants like ammonia and CO2, they don't fall under F-gas legislation. So F-gas legislation is not only affecting us in the UK, but it's a with, with other legislation affecting across the world. Uh, we've got 197 countries which are also looking to redu reduce the amount of HFCs produced by 2047. And also within the UK, violations to F-gas legislation are now um, implementing fines against violations to F-gas legislation which can affect a lot of small businesses as well with some fines up to £200,000. So what I have over here is a, an indication of the, the, the price changes that we've seen with HFCs over the last few years. If you have a look, this one, this, this slide over here is from 2014 to 2018. You notice there's a massive hike with refrigerants like 404A. Uh, with, with the change in F-gas legislation, it leaves clients and end users at large risks with fluctuating refrigerant prices. You'll notice that there's been a decline recently um, with the prices. And if you have a look at the, the, um, the table that I've got up here, you'll notice a very stable price with regards to CO2 and ammonia. Um, when you have a look at things like 404A, which has seen price increases of almost 700% over a four-year period. So when we had the phase out of R22 a few years back, a lot of, a lot of um, companies were putting drop-ins like R422D. And if you have a look at the cost of something like that at the moment, for a simple system with 250 kilograms, you're going to be spending around about 19 grand just to replace the refrigerant charge. So why CO2? CO2 is a natural substance. Um, a lot of the CO2 that we use in refrigeration is actually a byproduct of other uh, manufacturing processes like brewery industries and things like that where CO2, the, the waste CO2 that we use can be reclaimed and used in refrigerant processes. It's not covered under F-gas legislation, so therefore we don't have any time scales or any phase outs of that that, are, that will be happening in the next few years. Uh, Non-flammable non-toxic as well so it's a lot safer to use than some of the, the potential HFOs and A2L refrigerants that are coming out in the market at the moment as well. Um, it's not patented so it keeps the cost down from that aspect as well and from a efficiency aspect it's a lot better in mild to colder climates than you would find with HFCs as well. Because of the volumetric efficiency which means that one kilogram of CO2 can absorb a lot more heat than one kilogram of HFCs, we can get away with smaller pipe work, smaller compressors and smaller components as well, which is, which is an add bonus for um, size aspect of things as well. Um, why ammonia? So same with ammonia and CO2 is we've got very low GWP with ammonia and a zero ODP. Uh, um, with regards to efficiency, ammonia is always a winner, it's better than CO2, uh, where CO2 is better than our HFCs. It's a, a low-cost refrigerant. It's not. It's not. It's a refrigerant that's actually manufactured specifically, but a large proportion of the ammonia that's manufactured is used in the agricultural industry as well. The ammonia that we use in refrigeration system is just of a higher quality. There's a lot of development that's been going on in the last 10 years with regards to low-charge ammonia systems. Something which I'll talk about in the later part of my presentation. Again, it's not covered by F-gas legislation. It's been used in the refrigeration industry for 140 plus years, so it's, it's um, reliable. Uh, it has a very wide range of applications used in, in very small systems, 
where single figures with the kilowatts you can utilize ammonia. Quite costly though, up to megawatt type systems. What we've seen with a typical range that you would be utilizing your ammonia and CO2 systems in, um, for CO2 systems, we'd be looking at a typical chill range of 20 kilowatts to 500 kilowatts. Um, so when I say chill, I mean chill storage of around about two degrees, roughly around about that temperature range. Um, and then for ammonia, what we'd be looking at typical chill systems is 200 kilowatts and up. Um, we're not restricted to these ranges with regards to the various refrigerants. We can do less with ammonia, we can do more with CO2. It's just what we see typically in the market and what, what inquiries we get. Um, with regards to cold storage or freezers, we're typically looking for CO2 around about 200 to 250 kilowatts with ammonia from around 100 kilowatts upwards. But just to give you an example of not being restricted to these ranges, we've completed an installation quite a while back which was 2.4 megawatts on CO2 at minus 50. So quite a low temperature um, and quite a large capacity as well. So I'm going to be running through three case studies um, on CO2 systems. The first one is a single stage transcritical CO2 system. I'll just run you through the, um, the schematic up here. What we have over here is the air cooler, so the, the component which is absorbing the heat from the room or the product. Um, it then goes, the, the, the refrigerant then goes into what we call an LPR, or low pressure receiver. At this point, this is an overflow system, so we've got a fully flooded evaporator, which is overflowing by roughly around about 5%. So we've got 5% of the mass flow rate going through this evaporator would be going into the LPR which would give us some subcooling for the liquid coming into the LPR, which adds to the efficiency. With having a flooded evaporator, it means that we have a smaller component as well. The, va the, um, the gas, or the, the suction vapor, then pass it down the pipe, and any, uh, with a heat exchanger, which pre-subcools your liquid into the LPR, and then back up to your compressor, through your gas cooler, and into the interstage vessel, where it goes from a high pressure gas into a, oops, touching the screen, high pressure gas into a high pressure liquid in the interstage vessel. So this application was for a 5,300 uh, 5, cubic meter chill store, which is a production facility for processing potatoes. So you can see over there it was 96 kilowatts is what we managed to do on this system. Because of the low duties, we were able to utilize copper pipe for the installation, which cut down the costs of the installation. So we didn't need any specialist um, uh, subcontractors to install the pipe work and um, because of the copper pipe it's quite small runs as well lightweight lightweight evaporators so it made it quite an economical installation for the client it's just an image of the package unit the next case study I'm looking at is, is a um, two-stage transcritical co2 system this is for a production facility looking at pizzas um, again similar concept at the bottom over here but because we're looking at quite a large pressure difference between our evaporating pressure and our, condent and our gas cooler pressure we have two stages where same as the last one but instead of we have a compressor over here which increases the pressure from the low side to an intermediate pressure which then the high stage compressor pushes through the gas cooler and into the interstage vessel um, just an example of this one, we were looking at if we had to do this with a HFC refrigerant, just looking at the cost analysis, the difference between the refrigerant costs is, is over 10 times than you would pay for a HFC refrigerant, it would be 10 times more than you would with CO2. The last one of the CO2, oh sorry, there's some images of the actual package that was installed. The last CO2 case study that we're looking at there is what we call a subcritical system. Um, now this is a cascade system utilizing glycol for the heat rejection from the CO2 system instead of air through a gas cooler. It's quite a simple circuit as you can see over there. Um, so this replaces the gas, the gas cooler, the condenser replaces the gas cooler and because we have a liquid we don't need an interstage vessel. Now, this was utilized on a cold store operating at temperatures of minus 23. That's the air temperature within the room. Um, this is a great op 
option if you have an existing site where you have a glycol ring main and you've got potentially a HFC freezer and you've got spare capacity on your glycol ring main, you could install something like this. Right. There's some images of the actual package unit itself. So traditional ammonia systems, we're going to be talking low charge ammonia now. When you think about ammonia systems, these are the kind of pictures that come up in the heads for large uh, production or large storage facilities. Typical charges of around about two ki kilograms per kilowatt, but could be higher, could be slightly lower. So we're thinking low charge. What is low charge ammonia? We, we've all seen this on the top hand right hand corner or left hand corner of our phones. That's not good, but in the ammonia refrigeration systems, low charge is really good. What is low charge? There are two definitions that we have for low charge. The one is less than 1.3 kilograms per kilowatt. Um, and oops, I've done something wrong there. Ah, and the other one is the lowest possible charge for the system to operate correctly across its full range of operating conditions. And those are the two basis for our for low charge. So I've got two case studies coming up. We've got a case study for a low charge ammonia chiller. And this is a 59,000 cubic meter chill storage facility where we had 1.1 megawatts of cooling capacity required. Um, with this system, we managed to get t the charge down to 214 kilograms for the entire cooling process. So that's less than 0.2 kilograms per kilowatt. This was done with two ammonia chillers with a, with a secondary glycol circuit to give us that to give us the cooling within the actual um, the room itself. The nice thing about the chillers is that you don't actually require a plant room, which is additional costs, and you also don't actually require any water supplies to them because they're air-cooled units, um, which as opposed to a central plant with evaporative condensers. Here we have a schematic of, of what makes the system, the chiller, low charge. You'll notice that we've got a, a high-pressure float system, which will replace the need for a high-pressure liquid receiver. That then supplies liquid to our evaporator, which is a combined evaporator, place, shell and plate heat exchanger evaporator with an integrated separation area, which means that we do not require any vessels for separation, not, um, which also reduces your ammonia charge. One thing that's quite important as well is it's automatic oil recovery, so that aids to the efficiency of the units as well, because when heat exchangers get oil building up, they, they lose efficiency and they lose um, effectiveness. So the technology that we're using to get the low charge systems is compact um, heat exchangers, like the shell and plate heat exchanger for on the e evaporator. Um, if we can do water-cooled options as well, we can use shell and plate heat exchangers as bait for condensers. Um, but what these heat exchangers do is it allows lower charge, smaller design, smaller footprint. And so on the technological side, with respect to how we get the efficiencies out of the chillers, um, the, the technology that we're utilizing these days, where you can have compressors with VSD drives, EC fans on the condensers. With, these, with both of these components, it allows us to fluctuate discharge pressures and suction pressures according to the required duties and the required ambient conditions to give us the best energy efficiency from the units. The second case study we're looking at is a um, 81,000 cubic meter cold store freezer at minus 24 degrees. Um, so we've got 600 kilowatts of capacity over here. This one's slightly different to the chiller where we don't have a secondary fluid in the room itself, we are using ammonia in the room um, to do the, the heat transfer from the, from the actual room. Um, we utilize a reverse cycle defrost system on this, which allows us to negate the need for electric defrost on the coolers or evaporators. And we also utilize heat recovery on this, which I'll cover in a, a little bit further. So what I have up here is a schematic of, a basic schematic of how a reverse cycle low charge ammonia system would work. You'll notice we've got the compressors at the bottom discharging into an oil separator, then into a condenser, and then a, a float switch, which then goes through a subcooler in an LPR with your evaporators at the end, which again are a 5% overflow, which a small amount of liquid comes back into low pressure receiver to allow the subcooling to the evaporators on the liquid line. 
this currently system is operating in refrigeration mode. And here we have an example of what happens when it goes into defrost or reverse cycle. So you'll notice that the discharge from the compressors goes to the oil separator, but because the four-way valve has changed, we're now putting the hot gas into the evaporators and there it is condensing in the evaporators and coming back out and going through the condenser and dropping into the low pressure receiver, offering us reverse cycle defrost. So looking at the unit itself um, in this example, we were managed to get COPs from the compressors of 1.5 and that's just the compressor itself. Um, the benefit of this is it's, it's free of ammonia pumps, so it's, it's purely using pressure to get the ammonia around the system and no ammonia pumps, which are subject to leaks and failures as well. Um, the charge in this one was 0.62 kilograms per kilowatt, which is slightly higher than what you would get on the chiller, but because we're using ammonia inside the store, there's a requirement for a larger charge. One of the benefits of it as well, as you can see the pump on the back, it, we were using waste heat to heat up the floor in the cold store for the underfloor heater mat, which is a great use of the waste heat and made this unit slightly more energy efficient. So how do we get the reverse cycle defrost to work? Well, it's a single bore valve that we use, a four-way bore valve, which allows us to put the plant in reverse operation. And one of the benefits of it as well is it's a rapid defrost. So what it means is that you have less downtime with respect to coolers on defrost within your store. Evaporators being used are aluminum evaporators, which have got a much higher um, heat transfer capacity than stainless steel and carbon steel. And with that as well, the density is a lot lower, so they're a lot lighter, they're a lot smaller, which means that building structures don't need to be um, as robust because the coolers are a lot lighter. So just a, a brief summary at the end. So low charge ammonia, it's available, it's been available for a while, it's available for chill, it's available for freezing. Um, regulation is driving interest away from HFCs and non-natural refrigerants. Natural refrigerants are definitely the way forward with respect to legislative aspects and availability. It is possible with the new technology and the low charge systems to reduce the ammonia charge in your systems by up to 90% of 95% of typical systems. That means you can run 5% of the charge that you could have previously run on a typical large industrial systems, central plant systems. The, there are applicable applicable ranges for all the way from HVAC to large cold store applications with regards to CO2 and ammonia. There, there is, there is a, uh, a product that will meet anyone's requirements with regards to that. The, there's a continuous development with technology at the moment. The CO2 technology that we're using with regards to the components and off-the-shelf components that you get now, it's, it wasn't there years ago. That's why we're able to bring these products into the market. Um, and also our new systems developments that we've got, our single stage, two stage, cascade systems with the CO2, and also new systems with regards to uh, ammonia plants as well, reverse cycle defrost, four-way ball valves. So with all the components and technology that we've got, we've seen a definite increase in the efficiency of our, of our ammonia and CO2 systems over the past 10, 20 years, as opposed to the large industrial plants um, the, the small package units are a lot more efficient than they ever more efficient than they ever have been and a lot lower life cycle costs when you start looking at co2 and ammonia and compared to hfcs so we just got a a slide over here showing what your capital investment would be based on a, a cold store application looking at the three refrigerants r449a co2 and ammonia we can see as we go up from 449a to co2 there's an increase in your capital costs. And as we go from CO2 to ammonia, there's an even further. Um, obviously, both ammonia and CO2 are natural refrigerants, and at 449A isn't. But when we look at that from a total cost of ownership aspect, when you start having a look at how much is going to cost you over the life cycle of your plant, your ammonia is going to be definitely your cheapest, CO2 second and unfortunately your HFCs, it might be cheaper to buy a plant and put it in, but it's gonna cost you long, much more in the long term.